Welcome everyone back to weekly weather updates and in today's video we've got a slightly different type of video today. I'm not going to be able to put out a forecast because I'm unfortunately unable to record that today. But instead, I thought we'd have a look at how to forecast thunderstorms. It's been a big issue we've had over the past few weeks, big areas of thunderstorms. And it's something that we encounter most summers and we'll probably encounter multiple more times throughout the rest of this summer. So I thought it'd be a good idea that if we published a video, have a look at all the different things that we can view on free available weather models to see when thunderstorms may occur. So today we'll go through the WRF, uh, uh, high resolution model. Again, perhaps not the best model. Uh, some would regard the Arome or the UKV as a, best, a better individual model. But on the WRF, we can have a look at all the different values that even professional forecasters will use when determining when thunderstorms are on their way and how severe they may be. So we'll run through many different factors and we'll have a look um, at what are the important things to take note of if you want to have a look at these models and see if thunderstorms are on their way. So do remember, if you enjoy the videos, make sure you like and subscribe. And remember to follow me on Twitter as well, the link's in the description. So there's sort of two main factors when we're viewing these models about thunderstorms. There's the instability and energy of the atmosphere and then there's your trigger or lift when it comes to thunderstorms. So you need that energy, you need the instability in the atmosphere to sustain showers and thunderstorms. But if you've got all that energy in the atmosphere, it comes to no use for thunder activity if there's nothing to trigger the convection to start off. So we've got those two main factors and we'll run through what you can see on computer models to suggest how, uh, how significant either are. So if we do start on instability, the first chart we're looking at is the Cape chart, something I do regularly bring up when we're having uh, look at thunderstorms in the daily videos. Now, normally I don't go into much detail because uh, we do cover it uh, repeatedly and don't have enough time to really go into that much detail with Cape, but we will have a look at it in detail today. So off the WRF here, we've got the uh, SB Cape and we've got the MU Cape. Now essentially for the UK, these do come out to very similar values because of our uh, of our oreographics and the sort of atmosphere we do see. They're probably much more important when we're looking at areas like North America, when you can get very variable different types of storms and the energy in the different levels of the atmosphere can be very important for forecasting the different types of storms you can see uh, as North America and many parts of the of the world do have more severe storms than the UK uh, simply because of the energy available um, as we are way too far north really to tap into proper truly uh, hot and humid air that develops at the mid latitude so generally SB Cape and MU Cape are very similar but we will treat them separately here just for ease uh, of looking at the model so SB Cape is the surface based Cape. Um, so that is the value of Cape, which is the convective available potential energy in SB standing for surface based. And this is the value of Cape um, uh, when, when we're looking at how unstable a parcel of air is that rises from the surface. So you do have a, a parcel of air at the surface. How unstable is the is that parcel of air? going uh, upwards. Now, of course, that's looking at an individual bit of air, but we can, of course, look at that over vast distances and areas, and that's essentially what these graphs uh, and these figures show, is that energy that there is uh, throughout the atmosphere. So if we do have a look at the thunderstorms, as I'm recording this, we've got a big thunderstorm outbreak happening this evening. And you can see here through central England, where we are seeing severe thunderstorms take off, we have got high levels of Cape. And it is recorded in joules per kilogram and seeing values here of 1,500 up to 2,000 joules per kilogram or higher. Now, you can see here there is a large, large area of Cape, but it's really in this red area that we're going to see the most severe thunderstorms, the most amount of energy available elsewhere still possible and this is why we do see blanket yellow warnings sometimes like we have seen here i do have my gripe with those warnings because clearly there is a higher risk through central england for severe thunderstorms but we've got widespread moderate levels of cape um 
surface base cape here. Um, so that's why we do see these blanket warnings, because the energy is there, it's just the uncertainty with the lift normally when it comes to the UK. Now we also have MU cape, if we have a look at that. So this is the most unstable cape. And it's a measure of instability in the troposphere and the value represents the total amount of potential energy available to the most unstable particle of air found within the lowest 300 millibars of the atmosphere. Um, so it's more of a broad spectrum, so looking at the lower levels of the atmosphere, not just simply surface based. But in the UK, when we don't have two, uh, two crazy mix uh, differences of air masses, you know, these sort of cape levels can vary especially in places as I said, bring up North America, where we have, can have Arctic air masses colliding with um, air masses from the Gulf of Mexico. And that's where you get these cape levels do vary from the surface to the, to the, to, to the top of, uh, or from the surface to the different levels within the atmosphere. And that's why we can see severe hail, tornadoes, supercells on a pretty regular basis um, in parts of North America because we've got all these different values. But for the UK, generally, these are very similar. And you can see here, again, peak area of Cape is through central England. So we've had a look at Cape uh, and it's, as I said, the convective available potential energy. And essentially, you can look into the details, you can do some research on it if you want, but essentially it is the energy available to air when we do see convection taking off. So it's not a measure of if thunderstorms will occur, but it's a measure of if showers and clouds start to build, we do see convection taking place. There is that lift this is the energy available to those updrafts to form big storms. So it's definitely required for storms, but we can have high levels of cape and we can have no thunderstorms if there is nothing bringing that lift. Now the next thing we'll have a look at when it comes to instability is SRH. Now this is something we normally look at uh, as it doesn't really apply too much for the UK. Once again, UK doesn't see in the grand scheme of the world, that severe storms. But SRH is the storm relative helicity, and it's the measure of the potential for cyclonic updraft rotation. So essentially rotation within the updraft. Uh, and here we're looking at zero to one kilometers, and we can have a look at zero to three kilometers as well on the WRF. Um, so essentially we're looking uh, at, the, at the levels for rotation within the cloud and the convective base. So this generally will tell us once we have got storms brewing, what type of storms we could be seeing, whether we see rotation of storms, and that's something that's quite important for supercells and for tornadoes, which we can see in the UK. As I said, we don't normally look at this because it is more of a rare occurrence, but we can see it. Now, for example, if we look at the storms this evening, you can see there is some SRH down towards northeast England, East Anglia. So there is the potential for some rotation within some of these showers, but it's not particularly high amounts. You see we're getting just to some of these lighter green colors so really not high amounts at all of cyclonic rotation here again indicating that these will be storms but unlikely to see any significant rotation but i thought i'd put this in this video just for a, a complete picture of some of the things that may go into forecasting the storms that that we we see in the uk now, another major thing we have to look at is theta E at 850 HPA. Now, I don't normally cover this in videos uh, simply because uh, we just have a look at the 850 HPA charts in general. But this is sort of variation of those 850 HPA charts. Theta E is the quantity that indicates the stability of the atmosphere or the available energy in the atmosphere. So general larger values of theta E represent greater instability. So once again, there's another way to view hot air, uh, to view Cape. They're all coming from the same data, just represented in a slightly different way. So again, higher theta E values will indicate more energy available um, for thunderstorms to brew. And sometimes we don't always see that reflected in the 850 HPA raw temperatures. It normally is pretty well correlated, but not always 100% correlated. So it is important to have a look at this when you are really deciding if there are thunderstorms that are going to occur. So you can see through this afternoon to the evening, very high theta E values taking off through eastern England, getting wrapped around in this low pressure system. And it's really here you can see these turns um, 
in the ice bars, which will have, in the winds, we'll have a look at in a bit more detail in a minute. This is where we see the highest storm activity. Well, we've got the higher theta E values, we've got the higher cape levels, and we've got uh, and we've got the winds changing direction. So this is why we've got big, big storms brewing here. A lot of energy available here. And again, it does correlate with the higher levels of cape through central England. Uh, but it's important, again, to have a look at all the different values. Now... We've had a look at all the energy that is available to storms. So we've had a look at the CAPE, the convective uh, available potential energy. We've had a look at SRH, looking at rotation within updrafts. Again, insignificant really for the UK, but still something to look at. And we've had a look at the theta E values again, uh, the energy available in correlation to temperature here as well. But this is just the energy available. As I said at the start of the video, we've also got to have lift. And the two main things that give lift in the UK is lower pressure and winds. Now, when I refer to winds, I don't mean general just easterly winds or westerly winds or southerly winds. We're talking about convergence zones. Now, it's been mentioned sometimes in the videos and you might hear it every now and again on national forecasts, things like that. But essentially, uh, convergence zones are when wind directions meet and what happens is it forces air to rise, it gives that lift. So if we first do have a look at the winds, look at 10 metre winds here. So surface-based winds, which do run to this evening, if you look to southern England, you can see here we've got a southerly wind, and we've got an east southeasterly wind through East Anglia. Now, it doesn't sound like a, a major shift in wind direction, but where these collide through central England, that's where we're seeing the big lift. And we saw that on the theta values. It also had the winds in there as well. So you can see this is where we're seeing convergence zone appearing. And again, this is why we're seeing big thunderstorms. And sometimes you can see it across southern England, southwest England, parts of Wales, where we see winds caused by sea breezes colliding with winds from inland. And that's why we can see pop-up storms uh, as a regular occurrence in the summer in these regions because we have that lift and we have got cape around, we've got energy around, but we've got that lift. And that's why storms don't occur elsewhere, but they can occur in very uh, small areas. And it's sometimes also why we see stationary storms where they form on the convergence zone, but there's no lift elsewhere. So they don't form anywhere else. They can be stationary in one location. So this is another very important thing to have a look at, not only for storms, but for general shower activity, even in the winter, looking at, at snow potential as well, when we've got easterly or northerly winds, looking at convergence zones like this, is very important to determine where showers may occur. So it's a quite a big staple for shower formation, but of course in the summer, we've got energy around for storm formation as well. So you can see why we've had a look at all these values this evening, storms that we're it's occurring now is going to be sort of the perfect recipe for big big storms in the midlands and northern england now the final thing to look at is the pressure so of course sort of mean sea level pressure where we're sort of in in between high pressure and low pressure it's around a thousand and twelve a thousand and thirteen millibars anything lower than that we're on the lower pressure end anything higher than that is higher pressure now storms can occur in higher pressure but it's just more difficult and we can see dry weather in lower pressure it's more unlikely but it is possible so it's not a definitive sign that we will see storms, but it just shows you that there is that lift there, that lower pressure higher up in the atmosphere. So, so air particles are more likely to rise. And you can see through this evening, we've got an area of low pressure forming through northern England. Again, it could be, uh, well, we've got general low pressure, but it also could be sort of a feedback loop where the storms are occurring. And with that updraft, it causes lower pressure uh, at the surface and that just brings a feedback loop around so we get more deeper and deeper storms and actually a big low pressure system develops out of this eventually so it's a bit you can see a bit of a feedback loop when we get these storms that's why we get mesoscale convective systems which are large scale convective systems that form a big mass of rain and storms and it's because we see that feedback loop uh, loop occur where we see lower pressure forming as a result of storms taking off. So you can see here, lower pressure is required um, for big, big storms, but it's not uh, it's not, uh, it's not always needed for just pop-up storms in places. But you can see why all the factors we looked at in this video, which are 
needed or, or a good a uh, good ingredient for storms we are seeing this evening and that's why we've got yellow warnings issued uh, and we're very short on big storms so that's pretty much all of the values i would look at personally on the wrf i'm sure there are other things here that are important to look at and to think we haven't actually looked at any precipitation charts we've looked at other charts to show where it has occurred and if we feature just quickly have a look at the precipitation charts you can see exactly where the highest cape is exactly where there's a conversion zone exactly where the highest dte values are and the lower pressure is we're seeing severe storms or heavy rain uh, starting to develop within that so yeah you can see how all these different values can give us a very good indication of when storms do occur so i know there will be people watching the videos and thinking why suddenly are storms forming or why is it so unpredictable for me, uh, to predict storms is because these sort of values don't always align like they have for this event you can see all the all the different graphs uh, and the figures we've looked at all indicating uh, potential for storms in this region but sometimes we can get high cape we get no convergence zones we can have higher pressure uh, we, the winds can be down other times we can see some big lift, but not a lot of energy, not a lot of cape, uh, and vice versa. So it's not always all or nothing. We do normally get big mixes of the different I ingredients here, and that's why it is so difficult to forecast storms. Sometimes we have the energy, but no lift. Sometimes we have the lift, no energy. Uh, and that's why we're always very, uh, we're always scratching our heads when it comes to forecasting exact storms and exact, exact areas of convection. But hopefully in this video, you, you've seen the different values uh, and that you can yourself go over to Meteo C or uh, enter, uh, over enter, uh, to any website and have a look at their different uh, different values. I would recommend Meteo Seal. They do in general have the best array of different uh, sort of uh, different air, uh, different types of charts here, where some uh, some uh, models on other websites only have cape and only have precipitation. Um, they do have a very good array here, so it's probably one of the best uh, websites to have a look at if you are interested. Again, you always have to be pointing in the right direction. It's very difficult just to look at every indiv individual model and see all exactly a storm's going to occur. Normally, we'll have to look at the precipitation charts to point us in the right direction of where there could be storm activity, or it would be laborious going through every single model, looking at all the different variables but that's what the presentation charts are for really bringing everything together so we'll have to see exactly um what happens over the coming weeks and coming months but hopefully next time we post a video saying the potential for storms are coming our way you can have you can have uh, you can yourself have an explore over these models uh, in more detail than we normally do with the videos uh, because of time's sake at when things could occur so anyway, thanks for watching. I uh, hope this has been informative and hopefully allows you to do some research and some forecasting for yourself, really, when looking at the models. Uh, as I know sometimes it can get confusing when we do gloss over charts and say things are going to occur and sometimes it's not always apparent where that's coming from. Uh, but hopefully today I have shown you where generally we get a lot of the ideas for thunderstorms from and why things can be said to be severe thunderstorms or just pop-up storms, small areas of storms, multi-celled systems, mesoscale uh, systems. Uh, you can see where we can get those indicators from, uh, from. And this is very similar to what the Met Office will use for their warnings. Of course, they've got more detailed data, more models, uh, and more people looking at it, more eyes looking at it, uh, and more experience. But generally, this is the same sort of stuff the Met Office do look at as well. So as I said, thanks for watching. Hope you have enjoyed, and I'll see you again for another forecast tomorrow.